On this episode of the program, we speak to senior legal practitioner Jiti Ogunye about the proceedings of the election petition tribunal and key judiciary reforms the new administration can undertake. Also showing on the program, legal icon Afe Babalala condemns the severance packages for politicians and urges others to join him in condemning same. For the recap of the top trending legal stories in the news. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shiyeli. Let's begin at the Presidential Election Petition Tribunal. I started by asking senior legal practitioner Jiti Ogunye about his key observations from the proceedings so far. Well, my general observation is that there is a chasm, there is a gap between what litigants or petitioners and their lawyers uh, lead the public to believe regarding the substance uh, and content of their petition and their grants and what actually play out in court. And that's why it's usually better for the viewing public or the general public to wait on court proceedings. Uh, court proceedings may be full of legalities and all the technical verbiages that are used, uh, but, and therefore a layman may not uh, have a thorough understanding of all the bends and turns and all that. But if uh, the public is patient enough to watch the proceedings, to follow the proceeding carefully, they may have, at the end of the day, and the final analysis, a fair idea about how it will all end. For example, just one aspect. Whereas, um, when the petition was lodged, a lot of people were talking about uh, the need to, including senior lawyers, perhaps in a partisan manner, talking about the need to conduct the proceedings uh, more or less in a summary fashion and ensure that a decision was rendered before inauguration and that that could be done. We done it in other jurisdictions. We get to court. And those who are challenging the result of the election, the outcome, are taking adjournments, are talking about sickness, they're talking about processes uh, not being uh, exhaustively concluded. They are talking about the liturgy uh, of INEC and that INEC was not cooperating with them to bring all these things and all that. And look, these couldn't have been done in you know, that summary fashion that many people thought was possible. So you have a situation whereby before proceedings open, the judex is set up. Judges are, you know, portrayed as people who want to trade on justice, who want the thing to be dilatory and be prolonged. And hey, you get to the proceedings and then discover that it's a different ballgame altogether. So we need to be patient with that system and then get the best we will get out of it. There are a lot of emotions attached and invested in the proceedings of the Presidential Election Petitions Tribunal. And predictably, some people have already started to express the view that you know, we might not get justice from the tribunal. What would you say to people who express views like this? What I see on this occasion is that a lot of people who are not familiar with uh, our legal history, with our political history, with our jurisprudence, are making comments and giving opinions on things they are not very sufficiently knowledgeable about. And so the judiciary is set up. Uh, the judiciary is portrayed as an institution that can never give justice, which is not the situation even in a, a current situation. Many of the governors in this country, Obi himself inclusive, became governors by the grace of the tribunal. And he will tell you that he has confidence, you know. Mimiko, uh, Oshi Omole, Aregbe Shola, a number of them like that. Okay? So if it could happen for the gubernatorial, why is anybody thinking that it can never happen for the presidential? If the evidence that is produced is sufficient to warrant the tribunal returning a verdict that the election uh, was not properly conducted and therefore the person that has been declared had not been uh, elected by a majority of lawful vote cast in that election. So why do they so think? 
So I, I am saying that, you know, when people f make a forecast of failure, is either because their preparation was not sufficient or because they knew that they would not, you know, be able to get the success they think that they should get or they wish uh, to get. So you have to work hard for it. And look, in the 2007 election petition, the Yarabdoa petition, at the Court of Appeal, sitting as the tribunal, the presidential tribunal, the election was partially nullified. It was. It was partially nullified. It was when the matter got to the Supreme Court that you then had uh, a situation, you know, uh, like that, in which there was also a dissenting opinion, even at the Supreme Court, while the Kitobi and others, and people were shocked that the Kitobi could do that at that time, you know, and all that. It was a split decision, both at the Court of Appeal and in the Supreme Court. That 2007, whatever. So if we got that close, why is anybody thinking that if justice requires that it be done, that the Judex will fear that the heaven will fall on them if they ever do justice. I know it's a tough call because by our precedents, by our authorities, if you are alleging corruption, if you are alleging uh, malpractice in the election, you will have to prove it polling boot by polling boot. That is the standard that has been laid in our jurisprudence. And it is difficult in a presidential context to be proving, you know, uh, corruption, to be proving uh, malpractice, to be proving all that, you know, polling boot by polling boot. It's difficult all over the country. I know it's difficult. If you are to be allowed or given time to do that, maybe you won't be able to get through with that in a year. So it is better to have a clean election so that we don't even have recourse to the judiciary. Because we are now getting to a stage when some people are saying that I won't recognize anybody that is declared until the court says so. The court is not a certification bureau to certify results because it is possible that contestants will accept the results of election, the outcome, without going to court. It's possible. And when people are suggesting that the election should be viewed live, should be televised live. I opposed it even before they started the fireworks at the tribunal. Because I had written something about it in 2007. And I wrote it in the context of what happened then in 2007. The article was titled, should, uh, Is it legal to televise uh, an, uh, election tribunal proceedings? You know, and I said, no. One, the rules of courts are not so provided. Practice direction are not so provided. Three, public hearing is guaranteed by our law, meaning that members of the public can bear. Four, it is covered by journalists who, judicial correspondents who can faithfully and copiously report what transpired in court. So why do you need television camera to place. Now look at the other side. When you do that, in the age of social media, in the age of uh, all the uh, broadcast uh, stations being meshed to the internet, which promote, encourage immediacy of feedbacks, including people writing on the thing as the things being shown live or YouTube or streamlining and all that. This goes on, the judges have their phones, they go home after one day proceedings. Because it's not going to be a one day affair. And they start reading what people are talking about them. They start getting influenced. So you are already interfering in the proceedings of the tribunal. Mind you, there is no sequestration here. In the United States of America, where you have a jury system, Jury members are put in one place. They don't have access to television. They don't have access to phone. You know, they are guarded by the judge only. And then they apply the facts. It happened recently with the case of uh, 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 Trump. Okay? So those judges are not uh, secluded. They are not, you know, 
taken away from society. And so you want them to uh, be entertaining Nigerians on television. And for Nigerians to be, you know, just immediately after they are saying that, or as they are saying that, to be reaching them back. You are a fool. You know, is that what you should be saying? And all that. What kind of judges are these and all that? They are human beings. They are feeling. You are already interfering with them. With what they are doing. And so for me, that will not guarantee one inch more transparency, accountability, and integrity of the system. So I, I said there's no need for it. Let's round off talking about agenda setting for the new administration. I know that in the twilight days of the President Muhammadu Buhari administration, he signed off on the law improving the welfare of the judges. But what more do you think that this administration can do to improve the lot of the judiciary? I will start from where the former president let off. Yes, he signed something on welfare. So is it being implemented now? So it will still take the executive you know, to push and ensure that it is implemented. For example, it may help you to realize that judges are usually on the same scale. Yes. A judge that was appointed 20 years ago on the bench receives the same salary as a judge that is appointed today. I don't find that funny. The judges may not tell you this. So there are no scales. Up till now. Oh, oh yes. So these are, <laughs> it's funny. But because judges do not, they are not, they, they can't by their profession, they are constrained. They can't form a union. And then, it, I wish they could form a union, okay? Although it will be said that that will lower the majesty of the judiciary and all that. But these are the issues. Uh, for me, we will still need to refederalize the judiciary. Uh, judiciary, in a way, as it is the case in the United States, every state in the United States has its own Supreme Court. They have their own district court. They have their own state court of appeal. People don't know this. While you have the Central Court, the Supreme Court of the United States, there, serving federal courses and exceptional cases that may flow from the state which are challenging infraction of the Constitution. Those are the only cases that may flow to the Supreme Court of the United States. Otherwise, murder, all those cases, these are state crimes. So we need to refederalize the judiciary. Uh, we also need to do law reform as a handmaiden of justice delivery. Okay, I just cite one example. Um, in the last days of the past administration, there were a lot of allegations about corruption in the Ministry of Justice, particularly relating to uh, uh, judgment uh, debt, you know. The uh, National Assembly was accusing Malami of uh, fiddling with 10 point something billion that was judgment debt and all that and all that and how they do this. Yes, it will be, continue to be so. We should want to deal with that. Deal with the law. Section 84. The Sheriff's Fancy Process Act. And 85. Down to 86. That says that if you get a judgment and you want to enforce it against a government or government authority, the Attorney General must approve. Why? Is that in general the appellate authority over the court that are giving the judgment up to the Supreme Court? And that law was designed to ensure that government can sequence its debt, judgment debt obligation. But it has now become a platform for attorney generals to sit down and say, ah, you have a judgment of five billion. Let's split it into two. I will sign it. Otherwise, you won't get any judgment. I'm telling you. So how do you deal with that? And that's the attorney general that is a supervisory authority over EFCC. That can even get the chairman of an EFCC out and then replace him. So how do you deal with that attorney general? Other than look at the law and deal with that law. And this has flashed up in many cases, including the Algon case, where they sued the federal government, including those who got these humongous that they are uh, Paris, uh, debt reform. So it's, it's, you will need, you can use the law actually to deal with that. It will be good for this current administration to be imaginative on how policies 
and law can be used to even promote the justice system and justice delivery and reform the judiciary. I call for the interface, collaboration, synergy of the National Law Reform Commission with the National Assembly to so that in the next 12 months, we can then look back and say, how far has this, how far has this administration gone uh, on the issue of the judiciary and justice uh, reform and justice delivery at the justice sector in 12 months, in one year. And then we can say, oh, they've done this, we can take it. They've done this, we can take it. This. That's how society records uh, progress. And that's how humanity uh, you know, makes more progress. Welcome back. Legal icon Afeba Wallah has frowned at the idea of severance packages for presidents and governors, among others. The senior lawyer who hosted the Nigerian Association of Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture, NASIMA, at his university for their meeting, asked them to join in the crusade for a better Nigeria. He also believes that relevant bodies should be raising salient questions on the recent removal of false subsidy, funding of education, and the expensive political system run by Nigeria despite her huge debts. Now the new president came and said, look, I'm casting subsidy. Okay. The petrol rules, 500 naira. Where were you as I do not appreciate any festivity where you those out food, fishes, drinks, and so on. That's not important to me. I don't attend parties. I don't attend parties. I don't have friends. Whose house I visit? I've never visited any friend in my life. Your duty as Nasima is premise on the Constitution, which says the first duty of the government is to ensure safety of life and welfare of people. That should be your duty too, to ensure that we have safety of life. Do we have it now? No. Welfare, do we have it? No. The catalyst to overcome any problem, ignorance and other words. It's education. The pastor just tried. He raised it again. He was paying almost 20% for the education when he left. Today it has gone down to about 5% to where were you, Nasima? Why don't you cry out? 5% for education. I write regularly every week in the Tribune and the Vanguard. There should be no separate package for president, governor, and legislators when they leave. <laughs> this Sunday you read that 640 something billion will be paid to those who are earning salaries as governors who are enjoying all the family in the world, free care, free this, free holiday, now you want to give them several allowance of over 600 for something. How? Why? What is Nazima doing about that? We should avoid duplication of legislation. All we need is a unique camera legislature and not by camera. This is why we are one of the most expensive the social the world. Next, the ceiling age limit for public officers must be 70 years. What do you want the government after 70 years? Want to continue to spend public money to send hospitals and so on. Next, public office holders should not have foreign accounts. That is the duty of you, Nasima. He said he take loan. Loan never gets to this place. He finds his way to your 
account overseas. Then, money due to local government will be paid directly into the account of local government and not through any government. Some of them are being regulated now. And that's why the local governments are very weak. And just before we go, let's quickly do a recap of some of the top trending stories from the culture. We begin with the report that the People's Democratic Party PDP has called up three additional witnesses to prove its case in the ongoing presidential election petition tribunal in Abuja, bringing the total number of witnesses it has presented to 16. Lead counsel to the petitioner, Mr. Chris Uche, says the PDP presidential candidate has more witnesses to present to prove his case. He, however, did not state how many more witnesses the PDP wants to call in this matter. The latest round of witnesses by the PDP are mainly INEC ad hoc staff who participated in the February presidential election. In the petition of the Allied People's Movement challenging the victory of President Tinubu, counsel to the petitioner, Yakubu Mekasua, told the tribunal that though the previous adjournment was to enable parties obtain a copy of the Supreme Court judgment on a similar matter, the parties were yet to access the judgment. The respondents did not oppose his request for an adjournment, and the tribunal adjourned till June the 19th. In yet another suit against President Tinubu, a federal high court sitting in Abuja has struck out the suit filed by five residents of the Federal Capital Territory, seeking to stop his inauguration as President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The court, presided over by Justice Inyang Ekwo, struck out the suit on the grounds that the plaintiffs lacked the locus standi to institute the matter and failure of the plaintiffs to demonstrate to the court that similar subject is not pending before the Presidential Election Petition Tribunal, which proceedings are ongoing. Justice Ekwa consequently ordered Mr. Chuks Wachuku, the lawyer representing the plaintiffs, to pay the Attorney General of the Federation and Chief Justice of Nigeria, listed as first and second defendants in the case, a fine of 10 million naira each. He directed that until Mr. Nwachiku offsets the 20 million naira fine, no further action should be taken on the matter. In Ogun State, political thugs who invaded Ishabo, venue of the governorship election petition, have attacked a former governorship aspirant of the People's Democratic Party in Ogun State, Mr. Shegun Shoumi. The thugs in their large numbers had come to support their political parties as the tribunal began sitting. The inaugural sitting began amid tight security as the road leading to the venue within the magistrate court premises was cordoned off by a combined team of security operatives. Hearing commenced in the petition filed by the PDP governorship candidate, Mr. Ladia Debutu, against Dakwa Biodun of the All Progressives Congress, APC. The governorship candidate, Mr. Shomi, arrived at the court's gate into the hands of the fierce-looking thugs. Witnesses said Shomi was introducing himself to the security agents manning the gate when the thugs descended on him with sticks. He, however, escaped by the whiskers. Reacting to this development, Mr. Shomi has called for the relocation of the tribunal sitting to Abuja as a result of the observed security lapses. We round off with the report that President Bola Tinubu on Thursday at the State House assented to a fresh amendment of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. President Tinubu signed into law the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, Fifth Alteration, Number 37, 2023, presented by the outgoing Ninth National Assembly. With the signing of the Constitutional Amendment Bill, the retirement, age and pension rights of judicial officers have been effectively brought into uniformity and other related matters. While signing the Amendment Bill into law, President Tinubu pledged his administration's dedication to strengthening the judiciary, ensuring the rule of law, and empowering judicial officers to execute their responsibilities effectively. And that's the program for today. If you missed any part of it, you can find it on past episodes on our YouTube channel. Do also give us feedback via any of our social media platforms. I'm Shola Shaley. Thank you for watching and see you next week.